Yeah, we're getting her going. We're getting her going. It is the episode 108 of the Three Guys Talking Ball podcast. Do I have that right? My math? That's what I, that's what I, I wrote down. Okay. Episode 108. At one of these and points I, think... I remember. I don't know if I want to keep – if we need to keep making track. I thought 100 is a pretty cool accomplishment. And then I think on the uh, on the iTunes it shows the amount of episodes that we have on here. And – keep that going and once we get to 200 which is 192 more or 92 more episodes then it's Seems then crazy. you know that's, that's still about that's, two years two years that's away still almost two years away that's a long time yeah <laughs> that's crazy to think that 92 92 episodes but it'll be here before you know it so yeah, a little a little under two years but yeah so yeah we've got a we got a lot going on it was another tremendous week in football Tommy DeVito is sweeping the nation. Grant probably had some chicken cutlets in his honor. Yeah, well, get yeah. out of here. Yeah. His his agent his agent actually is the one that stole the show. And I mean he looked <laughs> like Peyton Manning nailed it in the Manning cast, referring to him as as John Johnny Fontaine. It was like, oh yeah, that definitely that seems dude, like that that looks like Johnny Fontaine. <laughs> that dude definitely looks like he's called a couple shots to take some people out in his day. He's he's done what he's had to do. We'll say that. How about, but. Oh, hey, speaking of that, guys, um, one of my uh, one of my friends at work um, who's a Packers fan, not named Derek, his birthday was on Tuesday. So naturally, with the game on Monday, I'm going to I'm going to come in and ruffle his feathers a little bit because he gave me the business last Monday after the Chiefs lost. So I went up to him and I said, hey, Tyler. Happy birthday, uh, there, bud! <laughs> with the uh, with you the should, you should have gotten, yeah, gotten him some some chicken parm or some, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, some some meatballs with some the, some with wine, the, yeah, some meat, red meatballs gravy with the red gravy. Yeah. <laughs> red um, gravy. But, so it was it was it was pretty fun. And before I know it, there were six or seven. I was just giving him a good time, you know, doing yeah. doing the old Tommy DeVito. So it was, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we're gonna cover. We got. Our regular recap, but before we're going to do things a little bit backwards here. Usually we talk NDSU at the end of the show, but we're going to move things up. There's been some things that have happened in Fargo, I guess you could say. Uh, Sunday afternoon, it was announced Matt Entz, NDSU head coach. He was leaving to take the associate head coach and linebackers position coach at USC. Uh, I had a reaction video I posted not long after it was announced and where he was going, things like that. You can Check that out on all of our socials and give us a follow while you're there. Three GTB podcast, three guys talking ball podcast on YouTube as well. But, um, you know, happy, happy for Matt. He's a tremendous coach. He's going to help recruiting the Midwest with USC moving to the moving to the Big Ten. He's going to be a big help. He knows he has connections there. He knows how to get into some of these places, especially when the majority of the games that USC is going to be playing is going to be over in the Midwest. So easy pitch for them is, Hey, you're going to be able to see your kids play. You're not going to have to travel as travel as far. Um, he's also an incredible defensive mind. And the last time we saw USC play, they, uh, their defense was not much of a, a defense. They just kind of threw some guys out there and stood there. It was, it was a lot like the uh, stick guy meme where it just says, do something. And they didn't do a whole lot. Um, and, and being the associate head coach, I think he's going to provide a different uh, perspective to Lincoln about um, the offense, provide something that Lincoln, I think, has been lacking. And I don't know, Alex Grinch, I think part of it is is because of the system that he's been in. He was the d- defensive coordinator for Mike Leach, which is where Lincoln came from. So he played. So calling that defense is very tough. I think Matt is someone that's not going to be afraid and say, hey, help our defense out, run the ball, because for exhibit A is you can go look at the Colorado game where they were up 34-14 at halftime, and they end up winning that game 48-41. But they called nine run. There were USC in the second half of that game ran the ball nine times, and about over half of them were just because Lincoln called a pass, and it ended up being a Caleb Williams scramble. I I, I think you're going to see a shift more so to a complementary football style if um, if these changes that Lincoln is doing, these wholesale changes, getting rid of his long-term defensive coordinator, bringing in new guys, 
guys that he really doesn't have any connection to and aren't just going to worship his feet in the ground he walks on. He's going to probably hear some hard truths, and and hopefully in the end, I guess I, I guess I got, there's going to be a part of me that's going to be cheering for USC because I want Matt to succeed, and I think he will. He's going to take he takes care of business there. He's going to it's the stepping stone job. He'll get a D coordinator eventually, a Power Five potentially head coach position too, um, if he's able to turn that USC defense around. But um, as far as who the next coach is going to be, it hasn't been announced yet as we record this Wednesday night. Uh, there's about three to four candidates really that I kind of had circled or in the back of my mind as far as who NDSU could look at. Tyler Rold, Bison OC, Tim Polisek, uh, Brent Vegan. And this one's a little bit of a wild card, but he coached, coached the Bison on the D-line from 2014 to 2016. And that's Jamar Kane, who right now is currently a D line coach for the Denver Broncos. Um, and right now, I'll start with him. Is he coached? Like I said, he coached at NDSU. He's a tremendous recruiter. Uh, he's got Power Five experience. So um, NDSU, they are looking to move up to the FBS at some point. I think he would be help with that transition potential. Potentially, he's got a lot of recruiting stories. He's got experience in the. Uh, in the name image likeness path, which is something that NDSU is finally getting going in the uh, green and gold collective. Uh, someone that could go out, raise money, um, has good connections all across the country. He's coached at LSU. He's coached at Oklahoma. He's coached at Fresno state. Um, now. And yeah, last year he was at LSU. Now he's the D line coach for the Broncos. Yes, Ethan. You better hope he has nothing to do with the collective or you're going to get the hammer. So he can say you should donate, but he can't have anything to do with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he can give advice about how things should be doing and and getting people to getting people to donate, developing those connections is what I was, what I was getting at. But, um, you know, the, the big concern with him is if you go look at his job experience he has moved around quite a bit and something that Matt Larson, the Bison AD said when he wanted to, uh, when he had his press conference Monday that, you know, he wants someone that he wants to be there long-term. I don't know, judging by Jamar Kane's previous job, his, the stints he's had, he hasn't held them for very long. He's moved on to, I guess you could say greener pastures or different opportunities. I don't know if you want that where he's here for two years, has success and leaves right away. I don't think that's, good for any program. Um, I don't, and I'm not saying that coaches leaving is a bad thing because that, that means that you have good coaches and you're wanted elsewhere. And if it's a step above, congratulations, tip your cap, go, go on. Um, next coach is, is Tim Polisek, who is the currently the OC at Wyoming. He was the Bison offensive coordinator under climate. When he first got the job, he came back from Northern Illinois. Um, and then he went to Iowa. Uh, he, he, he's a football lifer. He is a, High energy guy. Jeff Kolpak had a story about him in his book, Horns Up, about how when he got hired from Fargo, he was a logger in Wisconsin. And he had to sell one of his some type of equipment to get to just get to Fargo. And then when he got to Fargo, he didn't have a place to live for like the first three months he was on the job. So he just lived in the Fargo Dome facility, just slept on a couch that was open and um worked his way up from the bottom and came and took a uh just worked his way up and got to where he was the OC in Wyoming um uh very very high energy guy uh you know the one of the stories that I remember is in 20 it would have been Kleiman's first year his first year as offensive coordinator he's up in the booth and NDSU ran kept running power and power and power over Sam Houston State and I guess he was banging on the glass screaming let's effing go and um he he's definitely a uh he'd be a salesman for the for the program he, very similar to the way Croy, Craig Bull was he's not afraid to get out out into the community kiss babies another person that's going to be very good about establishing relationships he's a great great out on the recruiting trail as well um and someone that has experience with NIL and recruiting and power 5 group of 5 experience so another another great hire that i think ndsu probably i think if you had to do a top two i think he is on that short list um the next one 
is Brent Vegan, who's he's currently the Montana State head coach. He's he was offensive coordinator under Craig Bowl. Um, he followed him to Wyoming when Craig got the job there. Played at NDSU. He's from Buxton, North Dakota, which is just north of Fargo, I believe. His wife's from here. He applied for the head job back in 2018, didn't get it when Kleiman left. But um his name, his name is kind of cooled down as far as the um as far as a candidate goes. Um, it sounds like he's pretty content out in Bozeman, has a good thing going. He's got a good team. Um, just have to keep building. And then the last one would be Tyler Roll, who is I think he is the team favorite. I think the the first name that popped up in my mind and a lot of Bison fans' mind that if Entz were to leave, he would be the head man in charge. I think if there were odds, he'd be the betting favorite. He's NDS current Bison OC. He's done a tremendous job. He applied for a job back two years ago, I believe, at East Tennessee State. Uh, didn't get it. Um, he's the player's choice. Yesterday or Tuesday, there was a big – there was a big uh, – thing on Twitter going saying roll herd as his last name was spelled R O E H L H E R D. Um, familiar with the program he's played here. Um, he's got tremendous bison pride, which is a big part of that job is doing things the bison way. Um, hardworking. Um, you know, um, Dylan, is, is, knows he Fargo, the is he a Fargo kid too? Yes. Yep. Played for okay. West Fargo. Um, so very familiar. He he doesn't have a lot of coaching. I guess he he's never been a head coach before. He hasn't really done a whole lot of coaching outside of the Fargo Moorhead area. I want to say he was the D coordinator at Moorhead High, and then he was a position coach at Concordia. And then when Craig Bull left, Kleiman hired him on to be the running backs and fullbacks and fullbacks coach. Um, and then he was got promoted to the offensive coordinator when Entz got the job. Um, the players love him. Um, and I, I expect this to be a pretty quick hire as no matter who, I think by the time NDSU leaves, leaves from Missoula on Friday, I wouldn't be shocked if they have the name. Um, and it, it's tough because it's right next to the national signing day. Ne- national signing day, I believe is next Wednesday. Does that sound right? Something like Tuesday. that. I think it's or a, a Tuesday, one of those days. And, um, you know, like I said, he's the popular choice. Players are for him. Got a little bit of a, not, he's got a mixed, uh, mixed bag with him when it comes to fans. But I think a lot of the fans are that don't like him, don't understand the game of football. And all you got to do is watch these last few games and shows that he, he knows what he's doing. Um, and and if he does get the head coaching job, he wouldn't be the one calling the plays. I think he would. I think he needs to get some staff with some head coaching experience, similar to what Entz has done in the past. And climbing, getting guys that have been head coaches before, know what, um, know, be be somewhat. I I think Tyler Tyler is a fiery guy by all accounts, but someone that can be like the the ice to his fire. Um, I and I also wouldn't be shocked that if he doesn't get the job, I wouldn't be surprised if he leaves. Um, um I, I think. You, Dylan. Do yes. Do you think they kind of they might need to get away from the whole Bison way to win? Because they when's the last time they lost to South Dakota State, South Dakota, in North Dakota in the season? Do you think they need a little bit of a a kick from an outside hire? Do you think that would benefit them at all? I. It's it's hard to say. Um. Because like when Craig Bowl was not the popular hire when NDSU hired him, Gus Bradley was on staff. He was the D coordinator when Bob Babich left, and Craig he was only here for a year. Um, he was back in like the eighties. It was like in nineteen eighty four. I want to say he was the defensive backs coach. Um, I think NDSU is also in a tough transition phase where they lost a lot of guys to the portal. Um. A lot of turnover. They, a guy like a Trey Lance, who they thought would ha- be here for five years, COVID happens. He was projected as a first round draft pick. Left. Cam Miller's done a great job, but I think mean, Trey Mil- Trey Lance is was the number three overall pick. I, I, I think, I think you, maybe 
maybe you don't have to have the NDSU ties, but you have to have those qualities that NDSU prides themselves on and what's made NDSU NDSU. Um, because you can't completely get away from their identity. I mean, they're still a very successful program. They're in the semis. So I don't, I don't think you completely abandon ship because it's not like they, they've completely fallen off the face of the earth. Their goals are bigger. They want to get to the FBS if it, whenever that opportunity presents itself. Um, so I, I think they need some, like all the things I've hired, they need someone with recruiting experience that have group of five power, group of five, and then some power five experience as well because of the guys you're going to be going up against in the recruiting field, have those relationships from other areas of the country. But yeah, I I don't I don't think I don't think you need to get it completely away because I don't think the sky is falling in Fargo. Yeah, they lost a couple of games, but they've they've bounced back and they've somehow found themselves in a familiar spot. Um, how many people have they lost to the portal that like legitimately transferred up? I remember Parrish Cox. There was another guy I saw talking about this, uh saying um, the portals hurt them, but I just couldn't think of anyone that big of a name that made an impact at some school above them? Uh, Marquis Siegel. There, well, there were a lot that it didn't work out because there, there were a handful of guys where they, they didn't work out. They thought they were going to get something bigger, and it didn't work out, and they, they would have been far better off playing at NDSU this year than wherever they ended up. The only one last year that left that it's really worked out for is Marquis Siegel who was a starting corner for the Kansas State. Um, Omaha kid, it sounds like he must have known that he had op- had the opportunity and had the offer when he to go. And then um, Kobe Johnson, it hasn't really worked out at Colorado State. Dom Jones, Courtney Eubanks, none of those guys you don't really hear a whole lot from. Um, they and NDSU has they've come on as of late, but early in the year they struggled with their corners. And if they would have stayed, I think it would have been a I don't know if they would have won beaten ND or UND or USD, but they, uh, um, they, they, they certainly would have helped them out, but makes sense. Yeah. So then let's get to the, uh, the NDSU Montana game, the FCS semifinals after a dominating win down in, in Vermillion Bison are one and a half point road favorites here on this one. Uh, it's going to be a hostile environment in Washington Grizzly stadium. This is why you come to a program like NDSU or Montana is playing a game like this raucous crowd. It's going to be a tremendous atmosphere, tremendous view. Uh, but keys keys to the game. It's two thirty two thirty Mountain Time. Going to be on. I believe it's is it I ESPN it's two? I, I, thought think. It was, I thought it was yeah ESPN two. Let's see here. Or is this one yeah, on ABC? ESPN two? No, it'll be ESPN two. They were on ABC on Saturday. But gotcha. Um, they need ru- establish get up get the ball establish the run early so, like they've always like they've been like I've said the last two weeks. Um, Big Sky teams against NDSU they've struggled to stop the run, especially NDSU's run game. Two weeks ago when they were over in Bozeman and Montana State, NDSU ran the ball for 279 yards. Cam continues to play at a high level. Big thing again, something that they haven't done. Knock on wood. Hopefully that continues. Is, don't turn the ball over uh, and and don't make those mistakes. Don't give Montana a short field. Um, defensively, Clifton McDowell, the quarterback, um, make him beat, beat you with his arm. Get Win first and second down. Get obvious passing situations. Keep him in the pocket. He's not going to hurt you from there. I don't think they have good enough receivers out on the edge either to where they can get separation. And if NDSU is able to get pressure – and force him into a quick throw, force him into a turnover. I I like NDSU's chances. And then in the special teams, Junior Bergens had two or three punt, two or three special teams touchdowns this 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 postseason. He's a difference maker, difference maker on special teams. Kick away, kick it out of bounds on punts. Don't let him, or better yet, just don't punt at all. Just take the ball scored, similar to what you did against South Dakota. Um. And then injury-wise for Montana, they're both both their left guard and left tackle 
they both left with injuries against Furman along with their two safeties. And they I I doubt we're gonna hear anything on if they're playing or not until the until we they trot out there for their first possession possession of the game. Um but and and the, another thing for NDSU is tackle well. You know, they've done a good job tackling, um, not letting break guy breaking loose, getting those extra yards, making it to from a third and long where they could add a third and 10 to a third and five. They've done a good job of showing that up. It's going to be important too, especially against Eli Gilman, the running back who's got almost a thousand yards. Um, Minnesota boy, and then, right? uh, yeah, cause I want to say he's a transfer from somewhere. Delano. Maybe not Delano, Let's, but somewhere in that area. Dazzle, Dazzle, Dazzle. Minnesota. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's a freshman. Dazzle, Dazzle, Colocado. Yep. Yeah, that's what it says. But, um, and then take the crowd out of it. You know, don't let that crowd give life. Don't give them hope. Jump on them. Jump on them early. This could be. I think this is going to come down to a four quarter game, similar to what it was two weeks ago in Bozeman. Um, back and forth. Um, right now, NDSU. I. I think on paper, they're the better team. I think they are playing as a better team and they're playing with a ton of confidence and swagger. And I think with the announcement Ents is leaving, I think that that's going to bring them even closer together. They they want one more game with their head coach because he, uh, he said he's going to finish out the year. They want one more game. And I think they want to rematch against South Dakota State because we didn't talk much about that game because that game is going to be a blowout unless there's... It, there's similar weather to what it was against Villanova where it turns into a field position game and whoever makes the fewest mistakes wins. But um, I, th- I like NDSU in this game. I think NDSU is going to be able to force a couple of field goals in the red zone that NDSU defense is going to be able to force a couple of turnover or field goals in the red zone. I think that's the difference. I like NDSU to win 31, 27. So, there you go. Yeah, and the man has spoken. The man has spoken. Let's go to a surprise team of the week here. And how are you picking this week, big dog? Well, you'll see. You'll see. Trust the process here. All right. With okay. The, uh, the, Calm the down, first pick of the episode, episode 108, three guys talking about podcast draft. The first pick is, can Ethan get two in a row? Two in Actually, a row. Actually, no, he cannot. Me. No. And then second pick is Ethan. And the third pick, Grant, what uh, do you have a guess of which hat you are? Well, based off the first two helmets you pulled, I think it's a red one, but I guess we'll see. Wrong. Oh, the Bills. Oh, Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. I picked, I, if your team won, you got the helmet. It's but you lost, they picked the team that they lost to. Yep. So – Thank I, was God actually, I, to pick the- I was actually thinking you might do that. I was like, he's going to go back and see which team, who they last lost to, and that was going to be the helmets you'd use. Nope. Nope. I thought that. I, I was right for a third a third of it, and if we're playing baseball, I'm in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> that, that That is true, but you're not in the Hall of Fame for the no, podcast picking. Nope. So my my surprise team – is a team that played Monday night. It's the New York Giants. Now, we talked about it as we entered the show, and I don't I don't know if Tommy DeVito is the long-term answer. I don't know if he's a franchise quarterback or what his NFL future holds. Oh, he's but not. damn it, it is fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> the team the team rallies around him. The fan base loves him. They they got the Sopranos theme sync going on as he runs out. The uh the Italian fingers, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. that is. Uh, his his dad kissing anybody in sight. The tailgate that they have, the the Devito family tailgate looks incredible. Just an Italian spread, and they're playing hard, confidence. They just went down the field. They didn't get rattled. They went and led the uh, led a comeback, come from behind victory after the giant after the Packers scored. Tommy Cool. Just went right down, got him into field goal range, kicked the game-winning field goal. This offense has some type of pulse. Saquon Barkley looks like he's having fun again. 
Um, and, and Brian Dable's showing why he's a head coach in the league. You know, I think it just comes down to this. Their uniforms they had were absolutely beautiful. They were great. Um, with the Giants written on the helmet, the light blue um, with, with the red stripe and the white pants. If there's one thing we've learned this year, boys, it's the NFL needs to go back to the old uniforms. The uniforms yes. of the 80s and the 90s are so much better than the garbage we have these, these days. I mean, I'm sitting here watching the Eagles this week and last week thinking their uniforms suck compared to the Cali Greens. Like, it, 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 they're awful. And, and the, people consider the Eagles <laughs> Eagles jerseys, like, they're not terrible. But when no. you compare them to the Kelly Green jerseys, they're awful. Oh, they're, yeah, they look like the worst jersey in the NFL compared to the Kelly Green. Uh, but, yeah, those Giants uniforms just looked absolutely beautiful on Monday night. Um, and teams this year are playing great. I think only one team has lost in a throwback uniform this year. Ooh, I wonder who that would be. It was Tampa Bay when they wore the creamsicles against oh, the Lions. Oh, that's a shame. Did we, did that we is lose a versus sh- the Bears in our purple? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then against the Bucks too, so shit. But same thing. Those purple, so much better than what the Vikings have nowadays. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they lost With, to the Bears, too, I think, in those Yeah, seasons, you're right. So right? the Vikings yeah, are 0-2 in their mean. throwbacks. Yeah, that's what I mean. um, but e- even then, those are better than what the Vikings have now with their normal purple these days. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm here for the throwback jerseys. All of them. All of them. Which, uh, Dylan, bringing up the Bears, that takes me right to my team. We're going to the Windy City. Uh, honestly, they should have beat Detroit in Detroit. They, they screwed the pooch on that one. But uh, they beat the hell out of them on Sunday. Forced three turnovers. Held Goff to 161 yards total. Running game, I don't even think topped off. Or they went 140 for running, so good run. But when you throw two picks, you put the ball on the ground, it doesn't matter how much you're going to run it. You're not going to be able to score. Uh, Justin Fields is starting to look like the guy. Not ex- not like incredible, but gets the job done. 19 to 33 for a little over almost 200. No, ter- Actually, I think with – take that back. Without the sacks, I think he did throw for 200. Yeah, 223. So um, – also ran for 50, Foreman ran for 50, so they averaged almost five yards a carry. And against that defensive front, the the line there, that's pretty damn good versus the Lions, I'm going to admit. But uh, Bears are looking legit. They're looking better, and the Lions are exactly who we thought they were. They're <laughs> not the team that everyone thought they were elite. They, they're the Lions, and until they prove us otherwise, that's how it's going to stay. And they got they got bailed out too by the uh, Giants beating the Packers. Yep, which gives them a little bit of breathing room here what? in the in the in the North race. I don't think so. If, I, if the Vikings win out, they win the thing. They win the whole division. Well, yeah, they do have two games against the Lions, yep. but and then it's the uh, Green Bay. Yep, that's right. the uh, The Vikings are still Vikings are they, much they more of a threat. Are, right they're now. still in second Bulls place. Can look even decent because of this defense. They really have to score probably seventeen to twenty a game to win. I think if you're they, right and with this, with how good this defense is playing, seventeen's the number because I think so. They'll give up yards this year, but they're going to make people kick field goals. And mm-hmm. even if you score one touchdown and kick three field goals, that's only sixteen. So seventeen, seventeen's the number. But also, guys, what's crazy? Chicago is still going to have the number number one overall pick, and even though they're like you said, Ethan, they're playing they're playing better. So <laughs> mm-hmm. maybe they trade that for a king's ransom for some team who wants a quarterback. Because maybe I don't know. Maybe they sit back and they're like, Fields isn't horrible. Maybe they take or, Panthers' next pick. You know, like I, I, exactly. Or who knows? <laughs> maybe they maybe they shock us all and they take a wide receiver number one. Um, and yeah. they're just like, hey, DJ Moore and um. And Marvin Har- Marvin Harrison with Justin Fields? Who knows? Let's get frisky with it. I mean, they could legitimately almost be 500 based off their schedule. Like at the coming, Browns. Like com- oh, yeah, coming up, yeah. So at the Browns, which is probably a loss. Home versus the Cardinals, I'll give them that. Home mm-hmm. versus the Falcons, I'll give them that. At Green Bay, and I think right now they're playing better. I mean, I know I talked to Green Bay last week. They looked awful on Monday night versus the Giants. So, I mean, I mean why yeah, not shoot, that- that's eight and nine. If you're eight and nine, do you really need a new quarterback? No. Or do you just continue He's to build around that him? Defense. You build the defense, get a, get another left tackle, another guard, maybe another That's weapon right. on the outside. Yeah. Eh, who knows? I think it's possible. Maybe I Ryan Paul's still get a quarterback. Justin Fields ain't gonna do nothing. 
We've seen enough. It, that's, but, a discussion, that's a discussion for later days. But that is, we're, we're going to stay with the quarterback room here, boys. And I'm going to give this guy flowers because he needs it. Joe Flacco. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Joe <laughs> Flacco. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's go Let's not, into the playoffs. Let's this not forget this, all over again. The former Super Bowl MVP coming out of nowhere like he did in that Super Bowl run for Baltimore. I mean, from the pickleball court to the football field, this guy looks incredible. <laughs> um, His deep ball is still as good as ever. It's as good as ever. Oh. It, it, it's probably the best in the NFL. And uh, it's, it's the year of the backup quarterback. And, you know, on Sunday, Joe Flacco, a nice 26 for 45, but 311 yards and three touchdowns. That's unheard of. He's been in Cleveland for like 12 days. He's probably still living at the – the downtown Marriott or, or somewhere or wherever the, <laughs> the American Inn in Berea, whatever city the Browns are in. Um, but for him to really come off the bench and play this good, is just truly incredible. Um, and also do it without Nick Chubb. Um, you know, cause that Cleveland offense over these last years is power running game, uh, play action pass off this. You think without Chubb and a quarterback who's been there, like I said, for 12 days, they'd be dead in the water, but Cleveland's eight and five. And, Joe Flacco, he might bring these boys into the playoffs. And, you know, what's also impressive is um, David Njoku on Sunday had six catches, 91 yards, and two tutties. Joe Flacco looked like he was thrown to Dennis Pitta again in Baltimore. Um, we, we've we seen this song and dance before, so watch out for Cleveland in the playoffs. But, man, I got I tell you what, Joe Flacco deserves his uh, flowers, and I'm going to give it to him this week as my surprise player of the week. Well, I I also had him on. He's playing at the well. I, that was that was the thing back when he was on the tail end of his career in Baltimore. It was the discussion was always was he an elite QB? And he's playing like an elite QB right now. Hundred uh, percent. And, and you got to tip your cap to Kevin Stefanski. This they are the they are the eighth team in NFL history to win a game with four different starting quarterbacks in a season. Uh, who, you know, who, give, who, give the man an extension and give him and should who, be in the coach of the year consideration. Who's been the four so far? I know it's Deshaun, DTR, Flacco. Uh, the PJ Walker. That's right, PJ Walker. Yeah, I mean, yeah, your, yeah. Your point. Take Kevin Stefanski off the hot seat. Uh, give that man an extension and maybe some just for men. His his salt and pepper beard is becoming more salt. Uh, come on, can we get some just for men there in Cleveland? Well, come on, Kevin. you you have to remember, Grant. He he is in the state of Ohio, and there is also mm-hmm. another coach who uses a lot of just for men, and he coaches in Columbus, Ohio. Mm, so there's true. probably a very limited supply of just for men in the state of Ohio. Oh, because it all goes to Columbus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fair. But, also, I think dealing with number four as your quarterback might do that to your beard too. A little, a little bit. Yeah, that's that is true. But has it hasn't had to use it? Has it? Hasn't it? No. Yeah, or or uh, just coaching for the Browns in general. That that has that to do true. it too. But but also let's give Kevin team. Stefanski his flowers. Um, higher in Jim Schwartz this off season. Jim Schwartz, not a head coach in the NFL, but he's a hell of a defensive coordinator. Yep. And disappointing team. Disappointing team. This is easy. I'm I'm sticking home. <laughs> Uh, that's it's the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, the, the one thing I'm getting real sick of hearing with this team from quarterback Andy Reid, Matt Nagy, and especially, well, sorry, the Kansas City Chiefs offense is this. Um, this is what I'm sick of hearing. Hey, we're getting better each week. You know, I can see it on the film. We're still making these mistakes, but players are where they need to be. You know, we're getting better. We're getting this thing reeled in. We're going into week 15, boys. This is unacceptable. Um, Andy, in all the time that you've been there, you've had these mistakes corrected. Or when you didn't have the horses on the outside, like when Alex, when you first got there with Alex Smith, you ran the ball more and you had more two tight end sets. Um, but just the careless penalties that this team has each week. Third and six, we're going to have a false start. Big run play that's going to come back because of a holding. Um, you know, Rasheed Rice has a nice catch in the fourth quarter going towards the, um, towards the red zone. He's going to fumble. Um, MVS in the first quarter, him and Pat Mahomes, they're not thinking the same thing on a third down route. You can see the camera goes to Pat and he's putting his hand on his head. Um, MVS is doing the same thing. Like, no, I saw this. 
in the fourth quarter on another third down pass, Sky Moore. Um, he's not cutting his route shorter and making it flatter. Romo said that in the broadcast. It's it's the same mistakes that this team, that this Chiefs team is making um, week after week. And it's like, I'm sick of you guys saying, oh, we're getting better. No, you're not, because you're not even putting up 20 points a game. Before it was they can't score in the second half. Now it's they can't score in the first half. And you have the boneheaded mistake of not checking with official to make, make sure that you're not offsides. Um, okay, time out here. It cost Travis Kelsey a spot in the Hall of Fame. He's too good of a player. They shouldn't call that because it was such a great play. Now you sound as ridiculous as Pat Mahomes, and I can't take you serious. <laughs> um, so get get out of here with that. It's just <laughs> the year where this defense is firing on all cylinders, and you listen you listen to these wide receivers talk in the off season, the training camp. Hey, you know, someone, someone in this room is not going to make the team because we just have too many dogs on this team. There's so many good players. No, no, you're not. They're all, they're all horrible. I mean, this, these receivers have cost this team probably at least four games this year. So the fact with this veteran coaching staff and just normally how the Chiefs figured out in December, how they haven't figured it out, I, that's, that's my disappointing team of the week. I think they miss Eric Bieniemy because he was that light light a fire underneath your ass guy. He was the guy that was, you know, that would break you down and have Andy I'll, Reid build you I'll, back up. Dylan, I'll there take it. A, he he was the he was the hold 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 the hold people accountable in the building guy. Um, I'll say I'll say this another another coach they're missing that no one's going to say in the media. Greg Lewis. Greg Lewis is now in Baltimore. He's the Baltimore receivers coach. Zay Flowers. Odell coming off the injury. Um, Rashad Bateman has played well at points this year. These Baltimore receivers are getting better, and this Baltimore offense is playing better and better each week without Mark Andrews. So, um, Greg Lewis is not there in Kansas City anymore. Last year, Juju, he got it figured out. He had 70 catches for 1,000 yards. Um, so it's a combination, I think, of missing those two assistants, Dylan, like you said. It's coming back to rear its ugly head on this team. Greg Lewis, that's the uh, the guy that had the catch from Favre against yep. the Niners. Against that Greg San Lewis, okay, yeah, that Greg Lewis. I bet you, I bet you, he looks like a guy too that similar to Al Harris of the Cowboys that could go out there and probably catch three touchdowns, give five hundred yards mm-hmm. in a game. And then but also, I, I'll say this: the last two years, uh, Greg Lewis was the receivers coach in Kansas City from seventeen to twenty, when Tyreek, um, Sammy Watkins, and Demarcus Robinson were doing their thing. In these last two years, in 21 and 22, he was a running backs coach. Pacheco, seventh-round pick, and the Jarek McKinnon coming off the two knee injuries. So you miss a coach like that with these young players at these positions they have that are inexperienced, it's coming back coming back to bite them. So Baltimore's gain was Kansas City's loss and missing Greg Lewis. Yeah, and a little bit I – don't, I don't want to go that far – but some of the this Chiefs team reminds me a little bit of the 2019 Patriots team where they they just the receivers struggled to get separation. They were um, outside of Isaiah Pacheco. They weren't the Chiefs really aren't able to run the ball either. But especially with the receivers, these receivers give off the 2019 Patriots vibes where they just could nobody could get open. There's no separation and they just struggled to move the ball in a sense. I don't think it's it's to that level, but if we're comparing what we're used to seeing, that explosiveness of the Chiefs offense where they can still somewhat move the ball, but then there's struggle to get open, and then there's just those mistakes of lining up offsides or checking with the ref and just well, and just drop drop outside passes outside of, drop passes outside of Travis Kelsey, there's really nobody Mahomes trusts. And I think Rasheed Rice is someone, too, that couldn't get there, but he's still, I mean, he had a fumble on set Sunday as well. Mm-hmm. And I tell you what, the one player, now that he's technically off the commissioner exempt list and the games he missed, the NFL was qualifying for a suspension, I think you have to give Justin Ross more opportunities to get on the field. Um, the one time he had some significant playing time this year was against Minnesota, and he had that nice, you know, I think 18 or 20-yard reception that kind of got a drive going and with how they've stalled out this year, they need some explosiveness. So 
get the former five-star player from Tampa on the field and, and see if he can bring some light to this offense and some juice. Was it, was it, what was, what was your reaction when, when they, uh, when the, uh, the Kelsey to Tony play happened and then you see there's a flag and they call it, call the call that they call. On, it was the on Tony. Ulti- ultimate Cobra reaction. Like hand jaws down. I I don't really think I, I just kind of sat there in quiet for like three or four minutes. And then of course the game ends and Mahomes is going to kill the official. And I went back to watch that to see who he was giving the business to. Cause Caleb texts me. He says, dude, what was he so pissed off about? I go, he's either giving the business to the official or he's pissed off at the offense in general. And Caleb and I originally thought it was just the offense. And then you look back and you're like, Oh no, he was head hunting for that official. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, you know, so I had to watch that again to just to see it. But, you know, Dylan, it was the viral Michigan fan against Michigan State. Oh. <laughs> and That's just what we really should do is. is... Cul- culmination of just the last couple weeks, just the mistakes and the stupidness. Um, You know, last week against Green Bay in the first half, having nice drives, having to kick field goals. And then this week, even the first drive this week, they're they're going right down the field against a good Buffalo team off a of bye. Mahomes wants to throw a screen pass. AJ Epinesa tips the ball in the air and picks it off. Boom. Kills the drive just like that. And that it's just um, you know, and then on Buffalo's first touchdown drive when James Cook runs down the middle of the field wide open. I tell this to Ethan all the time. And we how are running backs never covered in this league? They're eligible receivers and they are just running scot free. It I, it makes no sense. And um, you know, the the Allen go, Falling towards the sideline, his body's turned at an angle and hucks it down to Latavius. But then Latavius fumbles, and Mike Edwards has a chance to get the ball up, and he just he can't fall on it. Like It would have been Chiefs' ball around midfield. So it was just – that play was just the culmination of how these last four weeks have gone. Like, it's right there, but they find a way to mess it up. Did you uh, initially? Did you think it was? Uh, did you think it was bullshit, or did you think it was the right call? Oh, when I saw the replay, I, it was the t- right call. I mean, the dude was damn near lined up on the defensive side of the field. He, he was almost playing a pass rush with Von Miller, uh, with how far he was lined up. I was like, "Well, you can't do it." And and the the funny part about it too is like they they show the video. Oh yeah, he checked. I was like. Er- Putting your arm out as you're as you're running to the line and then looking away before you're actually that, even set is not that, checking with the official. That first part was letting the official know that, hey, I'm supposed to be on the line of scrimmage. I'm covering up the tackle, not, hey, am I good? So that's just the internet, and that's just the toxic Chiefs fans out there trying to um, cry their way into having people feel bad about them. Yeah. And it was... It was, it was a very, very, very toxic. And Mitchell Schwartz actually did a good job of talking about, like, because they showed, like, the Von Miller clip where you you can't really get a good angle of if he was lined up. Yeah, his head's across the blue line. Well, for one, the blue line isn't official. Yeah. And he, he, he did a good job of explaining. I, I'm not going to go into it all. You can go and then check also, it out for even on that last drive, guys, the Tony play was on first down. They had a second and 10 where Ed Oliver made a nice play. I'll give him his flowers. Third down, um, it was just a an incomplete pass to someone. And then on fourth down, um, is it, um, uh, what's Greg Gregory's name? Rosuro? The defensive end. Russo. He, yeah. Russo, thank you. He gets chipped. He then has to go around. Taylor has three seconds to ch- attempt to block him. He doesn't ex- – he doesn't – um throw a punch with his hands he keeps his hands right next to his chest russo goes right around him and hits mahomes arm it's 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 little plays like that where they're just not doing their fundamentals where it's just it's disappointing to watch because andy always talks about how when he hires coaches he hires teachers people who teach football and there's no there must be no teachers on the offensive side this year especially in the receiver and offensive line room because they're making the same mistakes each week and they're killing themselves yeah but Ethan, who do you got for your your uh, 
disappointing team of the week. I'm going back with the Eagles. I think I picked them a couple of weeks ago, but second straight week, they've basically been a no-show uh, on primetime TV or I guess close to it. And I, it all comes down to the run game. They are not just a drop back pass. There you go. Yeah, nice game. I watched some of it. Good game. Um, then <laughs> as much as they might want Hurts to be a drop back passer, pocket passer, that's not what he is. Their whole offense is basically predicated on getting the run game going, and they haven't been able to do that versus elite teams all year. Even versus the Vikings, I guess Swift had a good game, but that was before the Vikings defense was really what the Vikings are. Right now, they, they wouldn't do that. that. That wouldn't happen versus Vikings defense. If they want to get, get better, their O-line needs to figure it out, and they need to run for more than like 80 yards, and 30 to 40 of that is literally just hurt scrambling for his life. Yeah, well, and Grant and I, we were texting back and forth of that game, too. And we were all uh, in the second half. It was it was almost like in the first half, Nick Sirianni forgot that he had DeAndre Swift on his roster. I don't even think he had a touch. And it was it was, it was just an arrogant, confusing game plan by him where, I mean, and, and the Eagles did move the ball well, but then they would turn it over. And Dallas did to their credit, they did a good job of getting it back, uh, you know, getting him into those obvious passing situations. And then they did a good job of punching the ball out and forcing turnovers. But then in the second half, that first drive, Eagles came out running the ball like, oh, there's DeAndre. So I mean, that was the most that was the first time all night that they actually looked like they had a pulse when they gave him gave him the ball. But at that point, it was almost too little too late because Dallas was up three scores and they're not going to Dallas isn't going to care. If you go ahead, run the ball, you're, you, you don't use, use eight minutes of this, <laughs> use eight minutes of the second, third quarter. I don't care. This is just going to limit more, take possessions out, away, away from you guys. But did you guys I hope it continues? Did you guys see in that Dallas's first drive when they're marching down the field, they panned over to Sirianni. Did you see how awful he looked like, Nick I, looked. My, I, I might be biased, but I think he always looks awful. Well, okay, that's fair. But like, he looked like extra, extra bad. Like he it had serious black bags underneath his eyes. He just he looked sick. He looked stressed out. It was a combination of maybe he had a sick kid at home. He wasn't getting a whole lot of sleep that week, and maybe he just straight up knew at that moment that this game was over. Um, and he knew that his team had issues because once I saw that, Dylan, it was still zero zero. I was like, this game's over. Dallas is going to roll these guys with he didn't have his normal arrogance or cockiness or confidence. He had the, Oh boy, we have some issues on this team problems right now. Like, yeah, Hey, we could beat the lions, the bucks, the Seahawks, whatever in the playoffs. But it's almost like, cause coaches know, they know if their team is good or if, if their team is bad. If or he when they're about to get their ass kicked. Yes. A hundred percent. He almost had the look on his face. Like, we can't play with Dallas and San Francisco. Like he, it was a look of just almost distraught. A bit. It looked rough. Yeah, and well, I'm I'm happy, and he's got he's got his work cut out for him too because the I, the Seahawks are down, but they are a different team when they play at, play at Century home. Link or play at home and and on Monday night. So the 12s are going to be fired up. But my my disappointing team is it has to be the Miami Dolphins. They came out sluggish on sluggish. The offense looked lost. Tua looked uncomfortable all night. Uh, the running game got finally got going. Um, that was when they had their success. And then they got finally got a hold of the game, and they got up two scores with four minutes to go. I I had Dolphins minus thirteen and a half, and I thought, heck yeah, we're rolling. This is good. Tennessee is falling off. They're gonna cover. I'm gonna go four and one for the week. And they're still sitting in the pole position for the in the AFC. And then all of a sudden, it just like that in the blink of eye. They, defensively, they just went conservative. They ba- basically a prevent and let Will Levis and Titans offense just walk down the field without any resistance at all. And, you know, watching, um, I, I don't know, Grant, if you watched Hard Knocks last night, but... Mm-hmm. When they showed the practice of Mike, they showed the practice and Mike was kind of getting on those guys, which I think yep. this is showing like Mike McDaniel come when you see him in these interviews and you look at him, he's kind of dorky, nerdy looking. 
Well, he's, an, he's he, an Ivy League he, guy. He, he's a Yale graduate. He is, he's a nerd. He's a nerd. He 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 is nerdy, but he's also one that he he is he's not afraid to jump in your ass. He's going to get serious. And it felt like just kind of the way that was trending, where they didn't look like they were practice. Their practices were sharp, and they just looked off all week. It felt like this that was a possibility of what was going to happen, and and it did. Yeah, Dylan, to your point, if you saw that team meeting last Wednesday, you would have thought on Monday they're going to lay an egg tonight. Because I thought that right away. The first couple plays of practice, Tua was off. He was throwing interceptions. Um, they just kind of looked like, hey, hey, we're happy to be here. Mike brought up the fact that they're the number one seed now in the AFC. You, you If you could have seen it before, you would have been like, yeah, this team's in trouble. And – I, I don't know, Dill. I even get that vibe from watching all four of the episodes so far. Just in their team meetings, people don't seem to be interested. They're just kind of there. Their they're quarterback room, the outside linebacker room, nobody's really invested into it. Um, they're just they're kind of there. They're, hey, they're, we're happy to be on a winning team. We're in South Florida, and people just don't care a whole lot. Um so, Which is also surprising, too, because they got Vic Fangio as the D coordinator. Yeah, but, you know, also, Vic, you can tell he doesn't want to be around the camera. So, but, yeah, to your point, maybe in the defensive team meetings, he gets after these guys a little more. But they just, this the current roster of the Dolphins just kind of doesn't seem to be all in. Or who knows, maybe that's just how NFL meeting rooms are these days, but. It's just a very lackluster, and mentally they weren't prepared to play. You could tell. Yeah. Yep. Let's go over to Told You So team. And I only put one team down because I was the only person that had any 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 bit of hope hope for them, and it's the team the Dolphins played on Monday night. I'm going with the Titans. I said that they are going to be a, that they were going to somehow make a, their way into the playoffs. Their backs against the wall. I think that is when they they are the most comfortable. I think that's just the mentality that Mike Vrabel has. And I don't know if you guys watched the Manning cast, but Taylor Lewan and Will Compton talking about Mike Vrabel <laughs> in meetings where it was absolutely hilarious. And it, that's where they thrive down bad back against the wall. Everybody's written them off. They're down two scores with four minutes to go after two very ugly, a, a muff punt and a botched option pitch. And what do they do? They come back and go steal a win against the number one team in the AFC. Uh, they may have found the franchise guy in Will Levis. Um, you know, and, you know, that was a spot, too, where it seems like a lot of teams, the Titans, if weeks passed, they would have just laid down and died. But to their credit, they found a way, dug dug deep, moved the ball, got got themselves into position, got a quick score, got the two-point conversion, the defense went, got a stop, got the ball back, and then prevent again. Will Levis finally seemed to be finding a uh, – developing that connection with DeAndre Hopkins, something that's other than – something other than Derrick Henry on that offense. Um, And right now, Tennessee, it's a bit of a long shot still. I'm not saying they're going to be making the playoffs. But after two straight wins, they're still hanging around a division that – Nobody seems to want to win after the after the Texans lost to the Jets, the Jags lost to the Browns. Who's the who's the fourth team in their division? Indy lost to the Bengals. Indy lost to the Bengals uh, to a backup quarterback. Um, you know they three of their three of their four games left are in the division. Um, so they can win out. They could find themselves back in the playoffs. And with with this this last month, I don't, I don't know if there's another coach that I would rather have in my corner than Mike Vrabel because you know they're going to be playing hard. He's he's definitely going to be in there saying, "Hey guys, we went out, we take care of business. We're going to win the win the South. We're going to be hosting a playoff game." I'm uh, I'm kind of sticking in the NFC North, and I roasted them a little bit already, but the Lions. Um, people forget they had to t- they had to slap a first round pick just to get rid of Goff. Like as great as he's been with the with the Lions, he's starting to kind of look like the, the Jared Goff that played for the Rams at the end of his tenure there. A lot of turnovers. Uh, on top of that, the Lions don't have a ton of outside options outside of Amon Ron St. Brown. I mean, 
uh, not Lachey, uh, Port Laporte is good, but they have no one opposite Brown. Like there's no one that Jamison Williams has been an absolute bust so far. Supposed to be some speedster. If he can threat. catch the ball consistently, yeah, like, he's shown he's shown a few flashes, but he can't catch yeah, the ball. He can't he's, consistently. He's like Kadarius Tony. No offense, Reynolds doesn't scare anyone. Like he's an old six four bodied guy that can't move very well. And I uh, Raymond Khalif Raymond, no one's scared of him either. Like um, they're gonna have to run for two hundred or more a game going forward if they're gonna win. Like their passing game's not good enough. And their defense is even starting to leak a little bit now, too. Like, I don't like their chances of making the playoffs at this point. Well, Ethan, your point, if Laporta doesn't go for 80-plus and they don't rush for 175, they have a hard time losing games. they are screwed. Screwed. And, yeah, their defense can't stop a nosebleed. Oh. Not Um, a damn chance. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's such a shame this year. This is such Minnesota luck that, Kirk would get injured in Green Bay because had he not, the Chicago game and the Denver game, the Vikings win, and they're sitting there at eight and four, and they are ready to pounce to win this division. Yep. Mm-hmm. Also, we're about we, to have some anarchy in college basketball tonight. Oh yeah, what's uh, what's going on? Uh, Northwestern's about to lose to Chicago State. That's seventy to sixty nine with sixteen seconds left. Didn't they just beat Purdue? They just beat Purdue. And there was an interesting tweet I saw earlier today. It said, bet against Northwestern because the last 17 times they have been ranked in the top 25, they've (laughs) lost the next game. (laughs) Classic Northwestern. (laughs) Team. That school's just cursed. Oh, Oh my my gosh. gosh. Oh, my God. They can't have nice things. No, no, they cannot. And, wow, the fact that we're looking at this review is terrible. This big white guy's hand for Northwestern is about a foot higher than anyone else, and they're looking at it like, hmm, did the Chicago State touch it? Uh, As if Chicago State is a white guy on the team. Big t- well, That's a surprise. <laughs> that Big Ten officiating on its finest right there. Oh, isn't it just great? You know, it's crazy this year. The NFL has become one step closer to Big Ten officiating with how awful it is. Oh, it's been bad. It's getting close. It's it getting is close. Getting, getting close. Um, But – you know, my I, I told you so, team. You know, guys, I said earlier with Joe Flacco, it's the year of the backup quarterback. Well, we're going to stay in the state of Ohio, and we're going to go with the Cincinnati Bengals because um, it looked like Joe Burrow was playing uh, football out there on Sunday with how Jake Browning was spinning it. Um, I think he only completed like 18 passes, but of those, he averaged 11.5 yards per attempt. Not bad. With two touchdowns, that's awesome. Um, you're going to win a lot of games in this league when you're when you're averaging 11.5 yards in the temp with uh, with the Bengals, and more importantly, they got Joe Mixon involved. I, I was saying earlier this year when they got going, Mixon needed 20 plus touches a game. Well, he had 24 on Sunday, and you scored 34 points. Um, so, hey, Zach Taylor, here's an idea: get Joe Mixon the football. Good things happen. Hey, Nick Sirianni, listen to that too. Yes. So coaches in the NFL, listen <laughs> no, listen to us. No, Get Nick, your running don't backs listen going. to that. Don't listen to that, Nick. Uh, yes. We're we're a dumb podcast. You don't need to listen to us. Tell us we're stupid. Keep throwing the ball as much as you can. But the other the other thing with the Bengals too is is that we talked about getting Joe Mixon involved. Chase Brown, the rookie out of Illinois, finally looks yeah. healthy and he has been a yeah. tremendous asset. He Most had that big screen run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, finally healthy, and, you know, that's a nice one-two punch here and going to take a lot of pressure off Jake Browning, who you we shouldn't be surprised by his success. The guy has play, played a lot of football. He, he was probably a three- or four-year three year starter in high school, started all four years at Washington. So mm-hmm. he has – he's a seasoned vet. He's a very smart quarterback. He's not he, – he's going to get you in the right play. He's not going to do anything to lose the game. But – and great, also, great choice by the Bengals, and they're still hanging around. They're hanging around. They're one of them seven and six teams in the AFC. And, you know, they got uh, uh, down the stretch. Boy, they got a big schedule. Um, who is it this weekend? It's the Vikings. And then I think it's the Steelers, the Chiefs, and the Browns. So it's a big month in December there in Cincinnati, but they looked great. And their offensive line gave up zero sacks on Sunday, and the defense had three. 
Um, this is the team that I thought would be in Cincinnati all year, and that's why I thought Joel Burrow would be my, the MVP. And when he could run for three weeks this year, boy, he probably – if he could have done that over 17 games, I think I would have been right two years in a row. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, credit to Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Bengals. They looked great, and uh, they're going to be hanging around. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to play these guys the last four weeks of the regular season because um, I think they might be getting this thing figured out. Yeah. and. Let's go down to the college ranks here, and we talked about it last week. We're going to talk some talk some coaching hires. We're going to pick – stay within uh, the uh, stay within the order. So, Grant, you'll stay up here, but uh, pick, we're going to pick a college team, whether a coach – the coaching hire, whether we liked it or disliked it. We're just going to pick one each here just to keep this show going. Here, we're already – we're already at an hour already. Wow. Hour flies by when you're having fun, right? So, Grant, you're up. Now, who what is a what, what is a college hire that caught your eye this year in the coaching so, carousel? Uh, we're we're going to continue to be the mirror of positivity here on the Three Guys Talking Ball podcast. And I'm going to go with the University of Houston hiring Willie Fritz away from Tulane. Oh, I had that one down, you <laughs> bastard. Um <laughs> I mean, these last two years that Tulane, he's got a 23 and four record, including a Cotton Bowl win over USC last year, and you know the the green the green wave they were rolling, they're playing they're playing well, and I think most importantly, Houston, they're coming into a new Big Twelve with no Texas and no Oklahoma. Who's really the big dog in that conference? Um, is it Oklahoma State? Is it is it TCU? Is it Utah? Uh, why why can't it be Houston? I mean, there's a lot of talent down in that region in this country, and New Orleans isn't too far away from Houston. So Willie knows how to recruit the area, and I think he's going to be able to build this Houston team up. Wow. And now, like in a conference where we're looking to find out who the big dog is, why can't it be Houston and a head coach who's had a lot of success these last two years at Lane? So the Houston Cougars with Willie Fritz, I, I like that. Let's see. I think it could be good in the new Big Twelve. I I well the, yeah, and I there's a reason I had that one down as well, Grant, because all the things you said. There's a lot of very fertile recruiting ground in the city of Houston and the surrounding area. He has ties to Louisiana, which I think is a big reason why they hired him. But mm-hmm. Houston in the past, they get a lot of their guys from that state. He's also coached at Georgia, Georgia as well. So I mean, there there is a lot of a lot of hidden treasure in both of those states. He's got good connections there. And if he if he hits on some guys early, can get a quarterback, develop them. Yeah, that, why why not Houston? They they could promote themselves as the premier premier uh, program in the state of Texas. Hey, I mean they're a premier program in college basketball. So why why can't the football team do the same thing? And we've also and and we we got our daily dose of of praising the wonderful city of Houston. Hey, look at that. Two yeah. birds stoned at once. <laughs> well, he's he's Willie Will Fritz is definitely not Italian. I don't <laughs> care anymore. I'm just doing it because because it's the celebration. <laughs> well, the chicken cutlets may be gone in two weeks, but while then, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm uh I'm going to the northeast. I'm going with Fran Brown in Syracuse. Uh, secondary Ooh. coach coming over from Georgia. Uh, they have. A, some absolute dudes on that defense, uh, elite recruiter. And on top of that, he brought Elijah Robinson, the interim head coach from Texas A&M, and their co-defensive coordinator up to be his defensive coordinator. Like Easily probably a top five recruiter in the country. Mm-hmm. The Northeast pretty soon could be on lockdown. Um, I don't think these guys are going to let many people out of, their, out of their hands. And I don't know if you guys saw this, but Kyle McCord, there's some serious steam about him heading up there now to be their quarterback. Is there now? Kind of, there is. He kind of seems uh, seems like he, well, I mean, he is from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, or Philly. So Philly, he's yeah. around, grew up around that area. And I, I think, think it would right. be kind of sweet to see the uh, see the Carrier Dome rocking for a football yeah. game. I bet you, I, I could def, I well, it's not the Carrier Dome anymore, but I it, could it's, definitely it's see the that place. Dome for, forever, brother. Forever, don't, yes. Forever the carrier. If we're being technical here, but the uh, no, but I look just judging by seeing it on TV. I don't think they actually have. I think it's still just metal 
metal bleachers here. Which and is the way it should be. Where, like, the pound, like, I bet you if you can get that crowd rocking, I bet you that would be a, that'd be a miserable place to play. That would give off some serious Fargo Dome vibes of just mm-hmm. raucous, creating an absolutely awesome college environment. But great, uh, great choice, Ethan, because that was one that, like, everybody kind of seems to forget about. But Fran Brown out of Syracuse, keep an eye on him in the well, ACC. Like, man, like Ethan said, if he can get those guys from New Jersey, um, and you know, the, the guys under the radar in Pennsylvania, let's not forget a couple of years ago, Syracuse wasn't a bad football program. No, they no. were always winning eight to 10 games a year. So stay tuned. Well, Dino Baber, that that's exactly what it was. Is like, he was about like one game from getting fired. Then he'd go reel off three or four straight wins. Mm-hmm. And that was, and that's kind of what he did this year. And then they just said, we're, we're, we're sick of this Jekyll and Hyde crap. We're, we we need to go in a different direction. Yeah. But for me, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go I'm gonna stay go back to the state of Texas. I'm gonna go with Texas A&M hiring Mike Elko coming from Duke. Um. And and would you would we expect anything different from a Texas A&M hire without some controversy or fireworks like we had on the uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving? Um. Initially hiring Mark Stoops. It's been reported. I don't know if it's been confirmed or not, but he was on the plane in midair going to College Station to take the job and had to turn around because Texas A&M rescinded the offer because it caused the fan when it was found out that they were they were hiring Stoops, who would have been a good hire, I think. They decided to just they, – they revolted and – which a classic Texas A and M cult following? Sounds like Tennessee and Clay Travis. So, but yes, <laughs> the, more Shiano, the more impressive part is they didn't have to get a guy like Clay Travis to do this. It was just the <laughs> the hardy people of Southeast Texas. <laughs> That's the cult. It. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure so, those so they, they, the same they, that have those deep pockets were like, but, maybe yeah, not. maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> if we can give eleven million dollars to our assistant coaches. We're not going to hire this guy. <laughs> yeah. So, so they go and hire Mike Elko out of Duke. Out of Duke, he was the D coordinator before he left for, for Duke. Uh, that was so he has some familiarity with the roster and some of the players. They spoke very highly, and that was the other rumor was is that the players wanted Mike Elko, and I think A and M they wanted to hire somebody who had ties to the school because. Like we said, Texas A&M has a cult following fan base. It's a very, their midnight yell leaders are just weirdos. And they, they wanted somebody who understood the tradition and culture of Texas A&M. Um, you know, the biggest thing that he needs to fix there is, is the culture. And um, Jimbo brought in a lot of five-star guys, but in doing so, he developed the one-star culture to quote, Matt Campbell from a few years ago. Well, um, five-star recruits. Texas has the five-star recruits. We have a five-star yeah. culture. And his first order of business is going in there and getting rid of getting rid of all the bad negative energy that's in that locker room because it sounds like there's a lot, a lot of already hit the transfer portal. Um, he needs to get, get the recruiting trail going and start rebuilding that roster and recruiting players that want to be Aggies, not just get in the bag. He, you need guys that want to be there, that have pride, have Aggie pride, and want to represent the school and the state and the um, college station That rather than not getting rich off NIL. I think A&M fans, and this is going to be tough to swallow, but they need to be patient here. It, it's going to take a while because it was very, very toxic over, over there. And it, it's not going to just happen overnight because I think that's just a program that needs to build from the ground up. They need to, they need, they need to establish themselves as a, as a developmental program and getting young guys in developing and using the transfer portal to plug and play a couple of spots, not completely relying on the transfer portal to just bring in a bunch of new guys, because that's a good, another good way to con- destroy the culture because they're coming in for a number of reasons, whether it be NIL or, you know, they're tra- they've transferred at some point or another for a reason for not getting along with coaches being a top 
a cancer in the locker room. They got to get, find the right people that are good football players and even more importantly, good people, good humans that are going to represent the university well. But 100%. 100%. So let's go, uh, let's go back up to the, back up to the NFL. Our week 15 game of the week here. And we, gotta, Grant, you go? Grant, we have I... three. Where did you, uh, was, who was yelling at you? Well, Ethan was, because my oh. screen went blank for a half a second. I could oh. hear you two, but I couldn't see him. Oh, gotcha. Well, there we got three games on Saturday. The Vikings play on Saturday, a couple other ones. Um, Kind of, uh, those Saturday games always kind of sneak up on you. But I'm going to go here with the, I guess I'm going to, I went with my team last week, so I'm going to change things up. I'm going to go with Eagles Seahawks on Monday night. Ooh. The Seahawks, Seahawks are fighting to stay alive. Eagles, they're looking to stay in the hunt for the, the NFC East crown and potentially the one seed, which seems like a long shot at this point. Um, I think Geno is going to be back this week, it sounds, it sounds like, and they're going to need him because Drew Locke is not the answer. Um, he he played well against Dallas before he hurt his groin in in practice. Uh, uh, Jack, Zach Charbonnet, Kenneth Walker are going to be back, giving him a two headed monster, take pressure off of off of Geno. It's going to be. I, I I think the Seahawks are. I expect them to run the ball well. I think this is going to be a game. I think Sirianni looking at it too that going into Seattle, thinking we got to run the ball, we got to limit the possessions, um, take some pressure off Jalen Hurts. Um, you utilize DeAndre Swift here, but I, I think this is going to be a low scoring knockdown drag out game where both teams are looking to get back on track. Uh, Pete Carroll has never lost four straight games in his uh, coaching career, and he definitely doesn't want to make it five. So I, I think both this is going to be low scoring and uh, I early, early pick bet here is I like the under in this game at 47 and a half. Is what the line is right now. Oh, I'd smash the under two. I think it's going to be about a 24, 20, 17, 20 type of game. I'm, uh, I'm kind of staying with, uh, with this. I've been talking a lot about Detroit. So I go away from them now. Uh, Broncos at Detroit is my game. I think it's, I believe it's Saturday night. It is. Uh, yep. I mean, if, if the Broncos win and KC somehow loses to New England, I mean, Chiefs aren't in first place anymore. Like that's how well, serious Ethan, they are here. Did you hear? Uh, did you hear Belichick when they they taught they asked him about the rumors of him being done after the this year, and he said his focus is on Kansas City. So we could oh, be shit. having a we're oh, on to Cincinnati over. game. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, Grant's it's, nervous. It's, it's forty-two <laughs> to thirteen. Like, oh, I thought I was done worrying about the Patriots, but now I got to worry about them again. Damn it! But, but no, the Lions haven't played a true defense like or a, de- a defense as good as uh denver probably in the last month and they're and i think they've gone like one and three or two and two in those games so it'll be interesting to see how golf looks and then it, uh if denver can keep going i mean i i think they there's a very real chance they win this game i don't think the lions are going to put up a lot of points so even if denver can be semi-explosive like they were versus the vikings i think they win this game well and you know Corbin yeah. sutton's good for one 40 yard, yard 40 yard of where you're like how did he catch that mm-hmm. like that and who knows maybe this is a week where they can get javante williams going yeah like and honestly course, if pat certain's gonna be shadowing i'm on ron just straight 100%. up he's going to be. who's 100%. gonna step up on the outside for detroit is really what's gonna be uh who's gonna win this game mm-hmm. yep it, it's gonna come down to running the ball too i think you know, like Ethan, like you said last, or um, when you were talking about the Bears as your su- surprise team of the week, is that he's resorted back to what he was in the 2019-2020 season for the Rams, Jared Goff, that is, um, where he's turning the ball over. He's just not, looks like he's got that deer in the headlights look. And, you know, we talked about the defense struggling. If you're If you're the Lions and that offensive staff, you're sitting there thinking, we need to feed Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, give them the ball, help our defense out, keep them off the field, play complimentary football. And we've been hearing for the last two years about how Detroit thinks they have the best offensive line in football. Well, 
go out there and show it because we haven't seen it in the last three weeks. Well, and again, guys, that goes to these NFL coaching staffs. They want to prove how smart they are and how that every team has an MVP candidate and we need our quarterback to get the stats. No. Run the damn ball. Uh, wear the T-shirts. You draft Gibbs in the first round for a reason. You sign David Montgomery. You trade away DeAndre Swift. Run the ball. It's not that hard. Um, football's not a fancy game. We make it harder than it has to be with the terminology and the blitz pickups and all this other stuff. But whoever owns the line of scrimmage each week is going to win the game. Unless you play against the Kansas City Chiefs and whoever drops the least amount of passes is going to win the game. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with that, with that being said, Dylan, you gave me the game of the week and I appreciate you for that brother. It's, it's gotta be Dallas at Buffalo. Um, right now, you know, Dallas, they're, they're playing, they're the second best team in the NFL right now, uh, behind the Niners. They're hot. Their offense is grooving. Um, McCarthy as a play caller, this may be the best season he's ever had. I know he had Rodgers for two MVP years, but this Dallas team is cooking. Um, they got, they got the, the snap the, um, the cadence going, uh, here we go. Yeah, here we go with Rodgers. It was green 19 for the longest time. Dak is feeling comfortable. This offensive line is playing good. Um, CD Lamb is l- looking like a better version of Michael Michael Irvin in the '88. Dallas is rolling right now, and they got a tough tough last part of the year with the schedule. Um, you know, I Ooh, think it's what Buffalo, one. Buffalo, Miami, Miami uh, Detroit, Detroit, and then, Washington. Yeah, and the year in Washington with the win over the Commanders. But um, if you want to keep this lead in the NFC East, um. You know, you got to win on Sunday against a Buffalo team that's hot. They're playing for their playoff life right now, but they got to be feeling good about themselves. Um, you know, the game's going to be outside upstate New York. I don't know what the weather is going to be like, um, but this is going to be an awesome. It's going to be a physical game, two historic franchises. You know, both teams, Dallas is going to make the playoffs, but Buffalo's fighting for it. I'm excited for this game, and I, I think this is easily the game of the week. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of like this matchup for Dallas because I think they're going to be able to get pressure on Josh Allen and force him into some untimely throws. Big thing with that, though, is Dallas on offense cannot turn the ball over. And this year they have done a really good job of not mm-hmm. turning the ball over. They had the one the one on, on Sunday night, which was kind of just a, I don't know, fluky, just weird play. But um, Fletcher Cox made a play. Yeah. And I, I think it's also important, too, for Dallas to not turn the ball over because keep that crowd out of the game. Don't let them mm-hmm. get rocking because that is a difficult place to play when that place is loud. And this year, teams have showed you can get pressure on Josh Allen. This Bills offensive line is not is not good by any means. You just have to keep him in the pocket. And when you have an opportunity, bring him down because – that Eagles game and then last Sunday against the Chiefs, there was multiple times where he avoided a sack just with how elusive he is and how big he is and helped Buffalo win the game. So when when Micah and, and DeMarcus and company can get home, get the quarterback on the ground. Yep. And uh, that that uh, wraps up our NFL Week 15 preview here. Let's uh, let's go over to Curveball of the Week here. And that uh, that is – me with the uh, with the question today, and I'm gonna go with if you could have one job, and this is there's absolutely zero chance jo- that you will ever have this job in your entire life, but you look you think about it, and it would be like, yeah, that would be a pretty sweet job to have. So what what, what job type of job would that be? Hmm. Well, you know, shoot, I'll I'll stick with the football world here, but can I get Kirk Herbstreit's job? Um, be, be in the <laughs> travel main, around like, with a dog. Yeah, travel around with a dog and essentially kind of be the voice of college football, but then also be able to do your the NFL games on Thursday night and kind of just almost be like accepted around the United States as the best TV announcer when it comes to football. Being able to go to just different cities every single week, you know, college game day, national championship games, occasionally get a good game on a Thursday. Just being able to watch that much football and be able to commentate 
uh, with that, being able to work through your career with Musburger, with Al Michaels, Chris Fowler, everyone else, and just the interviews that he's able to have and he's able to be on with different appearances each week and such like that. I, I, I think have it, what Herb, Herb Street had would be awesome. I'll say, right. uh, yeah. oh, go ahead, Don. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, yeah, Grant, that that is watch get paid to watch football. That does that doesn't sound like terrible. a bad life. Doesn't doesn't sound pretty. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, I would want to do head of uh the umpires for MLB, and actually hold these sons of bitches accountable for sucking dick. Um, <laughs> just being absolutely ass at your job. <laughs> Go Sorry, off, Hernandez. You don't get a pension. You get nothing. You get retirement, and you like it. Uh, you are terrible at your job, and you deserve to literally do nothing with baseball related the rest of your life. But uh, I think that'd be fun, actually, being able to show these guys, like, wow, you really do need to get better at your job. And I would absolutely 100% move to a challenge system for balls and strikes. Well, and then also, Ethan, on the review system, would we actually change calls when the call is correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think. That. <laughs> but <laughs> mine, mine, I think. Grant, your, yours was a great choice, but I think for me, I think it'd be sweet to be a pretty kick-ass to be a stand-up comedian. That'd be a cool job. Oh, gosh, Where, yeah. Especially, it, it would suck right away because when you're coming up and you're – you, it, it, it's one of the hardest jobs you'll ever do because you're, you're, you're going in front of a bunch of – a crowd full of a bunch of strangers in, that you have no idea and you're responsible for making them laugh – and trying to get those jokes to hit. Like, I can't imagine how difficult that is, especially coming out where guy like, like wh- where people think of the jokes or how they get up to the level that they are, where they're having Netflix specials, things like that. And, and just being able to entertain people and have the crowd in the palm of your hand and just making them roll on the floor laughing. I, that would be, that would be the cat's meow. And dude, even like then to be able to then pick up the art of doing something impulsive with a member of the and of the stands in the front row giving you the business, like where are these guys? They just they come up with stuff out of nowhere because someone's trying to heckle them and they just um they just absolutely bury them. God, that would be such a great skill to have, and it'd be yeah. so cool to do it because you're on top of the world. You can say whatever, and people are like, "He's a comedian. He makes us laugh." It's okay, yeah. It's okay. It's his job. Well, it's slowly gotten back to that. There was a stretch for a while where it was like if you if you said a joke, you were done. You were done. Done skis. But now it's kind of kind of mm-hmm. finally shifted back. Matt Rafe talked about how when he was his last stand up of how he uh, how he was arguing with flight attendants about how this put heavier heavier set lady was uh, taking up two seats. You wouldn't have to. I wouldn't. I would safely be able to secure my bag. And, and I don't. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I will. I will. <laughs> or, dude, even that. Even the special when he was talking about the girl in Baltimore at the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh. That's hilarious, and that's what I love. That's why we love stand-up comedy because they can get away with stuff like that. They can, and and it. That would just like the public speaking, the ability to that. And like you, you look like how, how people can come up with an hour of content by themselves too, where it's not just alone, where like even doing this, like if we had to talk by ourselves and we had nobody in studio, it, we would struggle to do it. I, I struggled doing it for like 10, 10, 15 minutes or so. I was able to do it yeah. with, with the NDSU thing for about 20 minutes, but that was the first time I was able to talk for something for a long time like that, like doing that. It was in, incredible. And then most of them, they start slow and build their way up, but still mm-hmm. trying to take up an hour of an hour of space where you're, you have to make people laugh for an hour straight is uh, mad respect to those guys. Congratulate. Keep doing what you're doing. You're you're doing America a service. Hundred percent. So, well, then I guess that kind of wraps wraps the show up here, fellas. Uh, 
I don't know what we want to do for call. I guess next week is. Next week is uh next week we could uh what do you say we uh preview a hmm. couple of bowls that we uh we want to keep our eye on before we the playoff starts. The non playoff bowl games. Yeah. <laughs> or or I I actually like this idea is we just go down the line, we name them, we pick winners and see how we do. Sure. So all right, well every, sing- every single bowl game. Yeah. Yeah, we just pick winners. We don't really discuss going to detail about it. We just okay. pick some winners, yeah. but we'll Yeah, we'll just have to There's a couple that I think that I think they actually start this week or this weekend, but Yeah. All well, right, yeah, uh, so look, it'll, be, it'll be it'll be Capital One Bowl week all over again. Yep, there it is. And with uh with that, thank you guys for listening. We'll have the segments of the show out on Friday. We'll uh post uh post all of our content on our social medias. Ooh, make sure make sure you follow you're following us there. Uh, leave a comment, post uh, leave a comment whether you uh, if you like the show or not. We're we're always good for criticism. Who knows? We might clap back with some smart ass comment. You never know. You can't rule it out with this group. But I'm pretty with, petty, so don't test me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.